Hello and welcome to the first video in the Writing Idiomatic Python video series. My name is Jeff Knupp. I'm the author of Writing Idiomatic Python. And in this video, like in all videos, um, we're going to take some non-Pythonic code, some code that could use a little love, uh, and clean it up, see if we can't make it Pythonic and more idiomatic. <clears throat> so this script, which uh, I've lovingly called bad.py, um, is meant to go out and scrape ESPN for uh, the information about college football players. So the way it works is it goes to a particular page, grabs the URL for all the teams, um, and then the URL for the pages that have the player information for each team. And then one by one, it uh, iterates over them, gets the information, and writes the data out to a CSV file. So now we know what it does. Uh, let's take a look at how it does it. So this is a good way to start both the video and the series because this kind of code is definitely indicative of the kind of code that novice Python programmers tend to produce. Um, as you can see, there aren't any functions. Everything just lives at the top level of the, the module level. Um, the spacing is kind of weird, uh, and that's really an artifact of the fact that novices tend to do a lot of cutting and pasting, both from the internet, but also within the file itself, just moving stuff around. Uh, and what you end up with is this hodgepodge of, um, you know, spacing and indentation, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so. I'm looking at this in Vim, but you uh, may have a different editor. Regardless of which editor you're using, it should definitely have the capability to run a tool like Flake 8 or PyLint or have a built-in tool um, to show errors in both formatting and also logic sometimes. Um, and that's what you'll see here all alongside the left side of the screen. Um, there are these S's. Uh, each one represents uh, some kind of error, and the squiggly lines uh, indicate in line where the error is. So if we go to the top of the file, um, the first thing I'm going to do is just basically clean the file up. And, and what that means is getting rid of all those S's. Um, uh, oops, I have caps lock on. <coughs> uh, OK. so. The first thing you'll notice is uh, URL, lib, and pprint. Those libraries are imported but not used. Um, so that's fine. I'll get rid of them. And as I go, I'm going to be saving this um, so we can see that the errors actually go away. Um, you know, we have things here like just random white space on a line without any text, uh, white space at the end of value. Here's another one that's pretty common, um, spacing around operators and um, just making sure you have consistent spacing around operators is important because it lends itself to a consistent feel. Um, and that's what we really want, which is, you know, reducing the cognitive burden on the reader as they're reading your uh, application. So after we clean up the kind of, um, you know, top level stuff, what is the end goal? Well, the end goal is to refactor this into something that is both readable, but also reusable. Um, and this, as it is now, is definitely not reusable, because if we were to import this from a another file, um, all of this code would run just without, um, it would run automatically. And, you know, that's really not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is to write code that is modular enough that we can import it from other files, we can make use of functions um, again and again in other scripts, and that's really the holy grail of uh, programming, is for programmers to be able to write code that they reuse and not solve the same problems over and over again. So the way that we're going to do that, um, there are a couple of things we need to do. The first is introduce an idiom from the book. Um, if dunder name 
equals Dunder main. Uh, and this checks if we are actually being directly invoked by the interpreter or if we are being imported by another module. If name equals main, that means we're being run directly by the interpreter and we should run our script, we do whatever we want to with our script. Um, so if, if it's not, then um, we are being imported and you know we don't need to do anything special. Um, <clears throat> so here I always call sys.exit main um, and the reason for that is, and I'll import sys up here, but the reason for that is being a good shell citizen. Um, you know, when your shell, uh, when your program exits, it exits with an error code, and that error code um, tells the shell if anything went wrong, and especially if you can imagine running this Python script as part of a pipeline of Unix commands, you don't want it to f be in the middle and fail, but yet have all the other commands not know, and then it, the pipeline keeps running, and it could be you know something that runs for hours and hours where the first or second thing failed, and if you had known that, you would have saved a lot of time. So we have to be good shell citizens um, and return proper error codes. In this case, we'll return the value for main, which is a function I'm just going to write right now, um, and I'll write the um, <coughs> Docu to the doc string as well. Um, and I'll just put pass here, even though technically I don't have to, because the uh, doc string counts as a. Um, the, the string counts. Uh, but anyway, so. The idea is that calling main, and you know, sometimes you'll call it with parameters if you have command line arguments that are being sent in. Uh, but regardless, it allows main to send or return rather error codes directly to sys.exit. So if main goes through fine and nothing goes wrong, main reaches the end of the function and uh, then returns, uh, but there's no return statement, well, it still returns none, and helpfully, sys.exit treats returning none as everything was fine. Um, any other number means something went wrong, so main can return one of those numbers directly, or if it wants, it can sys.exit directly from main, um, depending on you know, both the preference of the programmer and the type of error that occurs. So now that we've got this sys.exit and if dunder name equals main, um, it's time to put all this stuff into a series of functions. So the first thing that this script actually does is it goes out and it needs to get the URLs for each college football team that have all the player information. Uh, and it just so happens that there's a select box on this page, but really any team page, I think, uh, that has that information. So it's, it's rather easy to get to. Um, but we're going to make a function now. That sounds like a single unit of work. So we're going to now make a function that does exactly that, that goes out, given a URL, extracts the URL for all the teams in the list, and returns that list. So we start by building a function that I'll call URLs for teams. Um, this takes a starting URL, and uh, it will return a list of tuples. Containing, containing <clears throat> team names and their associated URLs. Okay, um, let's fix 
the indentation. Uh, so we're basically doing all the code up until this for loop down here. Um, so looking at the first three lines, uh, page equals URL lib2 open, that's fine. And then soup equals beautiful soup page. That's right out of the documentation, I think. Um, now URL list equals soup.find class equals select box, find all option. That looks good as well. Um, what it's doing is it's finding, I think there's probably only one select box on the page and it's getting all the options from the select box uh, and it will ex extract the names and values associated with the individual elements. So here we see for each URL in URL list, so for each of those elements, um, the team name is equal to the element.text, the team URL is equal to the element uh, treated as a dictionary uh, the value with the value key, and then it appends the, to this dictionary of team name and URL as keys and t the values as the values we just extracted. Now, you'll notice the doc string I wrote says that we're going to return a list of tuples. And the reason is this dictionary is really overkill. And it's a very common practice, though, to see um, when returning multiple things from a function, the authors feel the need to label what they're returning um, using a dictionary. So the key, the key is always just kind of the name of the, the description of what that value is, and then the value is the value. And like I said, this is overkill. Um, you can document in the doc string exactly what the function is going to return. And at the same time, you're going to be the one that's in 99% of the time, you're going to be the one that's making use of that return value. So you can take advantage of that fact as well. So in this case, we would just remove the dictionary and it, replace it with a tuple. Uh, except for we see this uh, curious looking line, line 27. Other, so otherwise, we would just return teams list. Um, line 27, it looks like it's taking, so from the second element, from index two onwards, um, so something is wrong with the first two elements. I'm guessing that they're null values or placeholders, something like that. And I'll just take the original author's word for it that these aren't good to use. Um, one thing that strikes me about this for loop is it looks like it might be a candidate for a um, <clears throat> list comprehension. And the reason I say that is anytime you have a for loop where the your end result is the creation of a list and the way you're doing it is by just slightly manipulating elements from something you're iterating over and then appending them to the list, that means it's a good candidate for a list comprehension because that's exactly what they do. So for us, and I don't know right now if this is going to be a list comprehension, and it's fine to engage in that sort of programming, kind of exploratory, but let's see if we can make a list comprehension. And it turns out we can. So we've turned the entire for loop below, uh, which is four or five lines of code, to uh, a single line with the use of a list comprehension. And it's certainly no less clear as to what's going on. Um, you know, the list comprehension, once you get the hang of it, is, uh, I got to make sure we have a tuple here. Um, actually, the comma does that. That's fine. But, um, you know, once you get the hang of list comprehensions, they will be easier to read than those for loops, and they'll actually increase readability. And all of this is discussed in the book. Um, you know, the 
idea of using a list count branch to replace a for loop just in this situation, in this exact situation, is discussed. Um, so team equals teams list two onward and then return teams list. Well, w we got to remember that return is a pretty powerful construct. Not only does it return a value, but it also evaluates an expression if there is one there. Um, in this case, we don't have an expression. Um, or rather, you know, we, we have an expression that evaluates to itself, teams list. Um, but we could have, you know, some complicated expression like A plus B minus C plus D, uh, and return would evaluate that and then return the result of that. So how can we take advantage of that? We always need to keep in mind that return has this power. Uh, and whenever you see uh, a variable being assigned to something only to be used to return it on the next line, it's a very, it, sh it should cause a warning light to go off because it almost always means that the return can just be put on the line where the uh, expression is being evaluated. So in our case, we can combine all three of these lines into return to onward. Um, and, and that looks like, you know, a pretty succinct and pretty easily readable uh, implementation for URLs for teams. So now that we've cleaned up URLs for teams, we've reached a point where it might be a good idea to actually test that any of this actually works. Um, and the way we'll do that is just by, I'm just going to delete all this other code because this is an editor and I can just undo. Uh, but I'll call it in main and uh, set a variable to it. And then we'll just print that variable out. And remember, we're expecting a list of tuples. Um, so I'll say that URLs or team URLs equals URLs for teams. And uh, now here's one more change we have to make. The parameter, the argument rather, uh, to URLs for teams here is uh, going to be this global variable, but it doesn't look like a global variable because it's not in all caps. And the reason that we put global variables in all caps is it makes it very clear. It's it's just kind of a agreed signal that this is a global variable. Otherwise, if you're deep in a function and all of a sudden I put URL here and you haven't seen URL yet in, in the function, you're certainly going to be a little confused as to where that comes from. So we always put global variables as all caps. Um, the names of them in all caps rather. So, and the question is, does this deserve to be a global variable? A global constant um, is probably a better term for it. Uh, and I would say, yes, it does. It's, you know, a constant string um, that isn't going to change between runs of the program and we're always going to make use of it. Uh, so I think that stays as a global constant. We might want to put an uh, underscore under it so that it doesn't get exported um, by when another module imports us because they really shouldn't have any use for this. Uh, but it, it does make sense for URLs for teams to take a URL in case this all changes in the future. So um, back to our testing of URLs for teams. We want to print team URLs. Um, oh, and there's one last change to make, and that's just to change the argument to be underscore URL. So let's save this and actually uh, head to the command line and run this bad boy. So remember, we're expecting a list of tuples, and that's exactly what we got. So all the way from the Air Force Falcons to the Wyoming Cowboys. We have all the college football teams, Division I teams, and their URLs on ESPN.com. Um, so this is pretty good progress. You know, we uh, were able to really just, without making any logical changes, to clean up uh, a 
quite a good bit, uh, a, a bit of code that really needed it. Um, all of these global variables will go away in a little bit, but for now, I'm just going to let them uh, hang around there until we know if any other ones are actually being used for anything. So let's bring back the deleted code. And now we come to a sort of fork in the road. Um, the, the remaining code iterates over each of those URLs that we've given it and the team names. Um, and it opens the page, finds the table containing the player information, and then iterates over that and saves the biographical information for the player to the CSV file, or, or rather it saves it to an intermediate um, dictionary called players list, uh, which again is a list of dictionaries. Um, and then in, in the next line, writes it out to a CSV file. So um, we could do one of two things. Uh, we could kind of follow the original intention of the code and just do it all in one function. So a function that goes and opens the URL and extracts the um, player data and then writes it out to the CSV file as well. Or we could break that up into two different functions. And where would we break it up? Well, the logical place to break it up is with one function getting the list of player information and the other writing it to the file. And why do I say that that's the logical place to break it up? Um, we, whenever we write functions, we want to minimize side effects as much as possible. So side effects are, you know, things that happen, things that a function does that do not include returning a value. So if I call a function and it prints out to the screen, that's a side effect. It may also return a value, uh, but the fact that it prints to the screen or if it writes to a file, that's a side effect. So we want to minimize side effects in general. And when side effects are unavoidable, as in this, uh, this is the case here, uh, we want to try to encapsulate the side effect as much as possible. So it makes sense then to give that its own function. So writing to the CSV file will be its own function. So we can, you know, kind of lock it down as tightly as possible. And that leaves the rest of the code to, uh, as another function that we're going to create. So in the second function, let's uh, call it something like player list from URL map, because uh, that's what we really have as the output of the first function is a map of team names to URLs that they can be found at. Uh, and so it'll take that list And what will it return? It will return a list of dictionaries representing list of dictionaries, each representing an individual player. Okay, that sounds good. So let's fix the indentation of this code and take a look at how it works. <clears throat> so first thing, teams list is what it thought it was working with. So we'll change that to team URLs, which is the name of our parameter. Um, so it says for each team in team URLs, uh, it gets this indiv URL and which is the, UR, the individual URL that it's working with at the time. Um, and again, it thinks it's working with a dictionary, so we'll have to be mindful to change that. And then it does a URL open, it, it beautiful soups the page, and it finds all rows and again avoids the first two. So, and, and then of course it iterates all, over all of them and uh, gets them all as players. Um, so what we need to keep in mind when we rewrite this function is 
or when we write this function is that in rewriting some of the first function we've changed some of the data structures that it's using so it's no longer using a list of dictionaries but rather it's a list of tuples so it, the for loop here for each team and team URLs um, we're gonna make use of the fact that you can use multiple assignment in the for loop to break out our uh, name and value team name and URL directly from team URLs while iterating over the for loop. So each time through the loop, we will get team name assigned to this element.txt up here and URL assigned to element value. So we can get rid of this URL and just call it URL. Souped page still works. Now here's an interesting um, area that we haven't covered yet. But well, actually, we kind of did in the return case. But let's uh, just describe what uh, how it applies here and what the heck I'm talking about. So we have this variable all rows, um, and it's set to souped team page find all tr, uh, and then all rows is set to all rows from two index two onwards, and then it's iterated over. So like when you return something, when you create a variable only to return it in the next line, when you create a, a variable only to iterate over it uh, in the next line, that's also unnecessary and can be combined into um, a shorter and I would definitely argue more readable line. So actually, let's first um, just combine lines 29 and 30 uh, which we can do just by putting the two on there, right? So soup dot find all dot uh, returns a list, and the slice index um, will you know return us the list that we're interested in. So we can get rid of that line. Now we're just left with lines 29 and 31, um, and it turns out that we can just delete that, move this here and remove the reference to all rows. So now what we have is a for loop that it's you can see exactly what it's iterating over. So the team page find all tr from two onwards. Whereas before it was iterating over something called all rows. And in fact it wasn't even all rows, it was rows from two onward. Um, but you know, the point is that this, in this way, it's more clear exactly what the iteration is being done over. If it just says all rows, there's, again, cognitive burden for the reader to determine what all rows actually is and remember that from two lines before. Um, so now it takes the current row, which is findall.td, uh, and this returns a list that we for each element we want to get the elements dot text um, then it puts it into a dictionary and then appends that to a list phew that's uh, a lot of work with this small data set so um, like we did in the first function i think we can probably make uh, some simplifications in this function as far as how it deals with data um, we want this player list, um, and we currently have it as a list of dictionaries. Personally, I don't see why it can't be a list of tuples. Um, looking at the code below, we're not going to print out uh, CSV headers anyway. So the fact that this, this is the number, this is the name, it doesn't really matter as long as it's kept consistent. As long as the order is kept consistent, it doesn't really matter which uh, element is where. So why don't we just return a list of tuples uh, rather than a list of dictionaries and try to simplify things a bit. So let's get rid of this current player. Now we have to figure out what we want current player to be. Um, and we could create just a tuple you know, in the normal way, we could say player equals number, name, etc. 
Um, but in looking at this code, something might jump out at you. Uh, if you look at line 32 to line 37, where we're doing the assignments, what we're actually doing is taking a, each element from a list, getting the text attribute, and then moving on to the next element. So another way we could have done this would be for element in current row, append to a list the element.text. Um, we would lose these number name and stuff, but if we're just going to create a tuple anyway, it doesn't matter. So um, this is another place where it might not be obvious. And, you know, if it didn't jump out to you, then don't be concerned. It's, it's certainly uh, something that takes time to notice, but this is another place where we could use a list comprehension. So instead of all of this, number, name, position, height, hometown, team name, um, I'm going to say directly into player list, append e.text for e in current row up, up to the sixth element. Um, so then we can just return player list, players list. Um, so again, it might not be obvious, it might not have been obvious that we could do this, um, and, and that is certainly fine, um, but this in this way we get what we want we get in, well instead of a tuple we have a list but that's fine um you know we could turn this into a tuple if we wanted to but it doesn't matter we we can deal with lists um so w w what is important though is we got the data into a, a kind of a format that we want um in a way that is succinct and readable um, so let's change the doc string to return a list of dictionaries to return a list of lists, uh, each representing an individual player. Um, and that looks good for this function. So um, now might be a time where we test it, but we're so close to the end, we might as well just go with it to the end and, and run the script and let that be our test. Um, so the last part, I don't know who this traveler is, but um, we'll make this, again, we're making this a separate function. So we'll say def right players to CSV. And this takes a player list. Come up with a doc string. Um, oh, and one last thing that I wanted to do in the previous uh, function, we have this players list uh, that we're appending to. Where the heck does that come from? Well, again, comes from all the way up here and it's a global variable certainly it doesn't need to be uh, we can just put um, we can just create a list here called players list um, and that's a, a better way to do it uh, to say that players list equals the empty list um, <clears throat> okay so back to our uh, CSV file writing um, that's called a uh, context manager, and uh, yeah, don't um, again, don't be discouraged if that's the first time you've seen it. Um, but what it does is it makes sure that regardless of what happens in the function, uh, in the rest of the function, or regardless of what happens within its context, it will always release the close the file handle. 
Um, so release whatever resource is being acquired. So, you know, uh, context managers are a big part of idiomatic Python um, because it's very easy to write code where you forget to, where you acquire a resource and then forget to um, release it. Uh, that could be, you know, a file with file handles. Uh, and you can actually run out of file descriptors, so not closing files really is an issue. Um, that could also be, uh, say, a lock for a multi-threaded program. Um, there are a number of places where context managers are useful, um, and, and they're very easy to write as well. So it's definitely part of, you know, the idiomatic canon uh, to use context managers. Um, <clears throat> this one, though, is writing to a file on somebody else's computer, so uh, I'll just remove that. We'll write out to footballplayers.csv. I don't know why the B is there. Um, as player CSV, that's fine. So now it creates a CSV writer, and for each player in well, now we have to call it player list because we no longer have that global variable. Um, it tries to write out each row, and it, if it gets to a Unicode error, it passes. Well, that's interesting, but um, it seems like, certainly since we don't have the dictionaries anymore, we're going to have to change this writer.write row. Um, but it seems like this can all be condensed because we're dealing with a list of lists and certainly CSV writers can write out a list so let's get rid of the try except for a second because if we run into an error we'll see it um, but let's just make this write row each player so that the writer is just iterating over the list of players uh, and writing each one out so this seems like it should work. Um, th the old code didn't have any CSV headers like we discussed, so there's nothing that we're removing in terms of functionality from the old code. Um, but let's take a look and see if this actually works. So, uh, I do Python. Uh, you know what? We gotta wire up main first. Um, so again, we're gonna have to do Team URLs equals URLs for team. How did that get changed back? Uh, the magic of editing, this got unchanged. Um, okay, <coughs> now we call player list equals player list from URL map. Um, and we'll just give it team URLs from 1 to 2, let's say. Because um, we, we certainly don't want to wait for it to print out the whole thing in case there's an issue. Uh, write players to CSV. Player list. Okay, oh, I didn't even save it. There we are. Now, let's make sure that there's no football players. Yeah, let's remove this. Okay, let's actually run it and see what happens. So, this is unedited. I'm, you know, if there was a mistake, we would have seen it. Uh, this part is unedited, rather. Um, but now we see that, okay, yeah, football players was just written, um, and let's take a look at it. Um, yeah, well, that looks pretty right. Um, so let's go back to our program and see what we need to actually clean up in terms of a cruft that would stop us from calling this a completed program. Um, first of all, we need to do all the team URLs. We can definitely get rid of these uh, global variables. They no longer 
um, apply, let's add to make pylint happy, let's add two blank lines uh, between all the functions. This blank line has white space and it doesn't like the underscore in URL. No, it's too long. Okay, well, that'll just have to, we'll just have to ignore that, that the line is too long. Um, one thing, oh, okay, this has to be moved over if we're doing all the teams. Um, okay, yeah, but now um, if we were to run this, it looks like this would be a, a proper program. It looks like it would work correctly. We can check that by, uh, let's clear, let's RM football players CSV and python bad.py um, bad.py might have to lose its moniker if this does indeed work so we're you know going to wait for that to finish in the meantime let's talk about what we did um, we took a very messy very um, difficult to read and difficult to follow script and turned it into a 47 line program and this is no longer a script you know this is a program it's modular in that it uses functions to group logical uh, statements together it's reusable in that it uses the double underscore main uh, it is definitely readable we've made a lot of enhancements towards readability uh, it you know, follows all the uh, guidelines in PEP8, and it just looks a lot nicer. Uh, I think you would agree if we compare it to the original. If you go back to the beginning of the video and look at the original version of the file, it's certainly a lot cleaner here. Um, and, you know, the, the point of this refactoring, and the, and the point of all refactorings is to make things cleaner, uh, and easier to understand um, without disturbing the actual behavior of the code. So this does the same thing as the original script, but uh, through this refactoring, we're able to come up with code that is much more readable, much more succinct, and does it in a much nicer way than the original script did. Um, so that wraps it up for the first video in the Writing Idiomatic Python Kickstarter series. I promise these will get better as we go. Um, so look forward to number two. And until then, I will see you guys later.